Good evening and welcome to the 10K Across the Bay Town Hall meeting. And we are at the Percy Thomas Senior Center. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I'm Dr. Faith Elliott Rossing, the Director of Community Affairs. And we have three of our county commissioners here tonight. We have Commissioner, oh, we have two of our county commissioners here tonight. We have Commissioner Steve Wilson and Commissioner Mark Anderson. Is there anything either of you would like to say? I just welcome everybody. Uh, this uh, event is the second annual item. Correct. And uh, everyone is very excited uh, uh, about how it's shaping up. But, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to one of the event owners, and that would be Sparrow Rogers. Uh, good evening, and thank you guys for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for being here, commissioners. We appreciate the support tremendously. Um, it was really interesting at a recent event. It was pointed out that not every county is as easy to work with as Queen Anne's County, and we sincerely appreciate that. Um, I guess I'm just here to tell you that everything is on track. The event is going incredibly well this year. We have some of our uh, security partners here with us this evening who've been working with us year-round to make sure that the event is secure and that we have a plan to keep everybody safe and healthy on race day. Uh, we are anticipating a significant increase in participants this year. Last year we sold 20,000 registrations, but we had a, a somewhat high attrition rate due to the extended registration period. There was about an 18-month registration period. So we had 23% attrition for the event last year, meaning that only 15,000 people actually crossed the finish line. So even though we only increased the race capacity by 5,000 this year, we project that we'll have approximately 7,000 additional finishers. So probably around 22,000 people uh, crossing over the bridge and coming to Queen Anne's County to celebrate. So, um, so just everything's going really great on that front. We're, we don't have all 50 states again this year, but one of the numbers that did stand out to me that was really interesting is that we have 49 different nationalities participating in this year's event already. So quite exciting, quite a global thing. Um, that's the, the numbers I just talked about was the finisher totals. That just, that just means that for, for all of our planning, we've accommodated, we have additional transportation. We have Larry Murphy here from Boston who manages all of our transportation planning to make sure that we keep your roads as clear as possible with that many people coming in. And then we have our partners here from the MDTA to make sure that we keep them as safe as possible. So where does this leave us? Well, you know, our goal is to make an event that is nationally recognizable and that really puts Queen Anne's County and the state of Maryland on a map nationally for what we call sports tourism. And you know, you can, you can see that with our projected number of finishers, we move up from sixth place to fifth place. Uh, we are, so we will be the fifth largest 10K in the United States our second year, which is no small, uh, no small task to undertake. And we certainly couldn't do it without all of our partners. Um, the event, so it's funny, but when we started planning this event, one of our overriding goals was to have impact and relationship with local charities. So we put together a committee from, uh, that had representatives from Queen Anne's County, Anne Arundel County in the state of Maryland, as well as the organizing team. And they chose charities to benefit directly from the event. So we do have three official charity partners. Each of these official charities receives a package valued at about $50,000. So what we do is we give them free entries, we give them free expo space, we give them free marketing, we give them free fundraising online through all of our participants. And 100% of the funds that they raise, they keep. So the event doesn't take any commissions or any any fees whatsoever off those individuals. However, three, three charities is not nearly the whole story of what we do. We have over a dozen supported charities. These are, these are charities that range from every medical cause that we're trying to raise funds and awareness for, like Team Hogan, the governor's team this year, is raising money for lymphoma research right here in Maryland. Um, we have Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and we have, anyway, we have dozens of supported charities. One of our pledges as organizers was to make this event accessible to as many charities as possible. That's not something that's done widely in the industry, but it's a commitment that we have to the community. So that means that charities that come to us, any 501c3, can come to us and get discounted entries for their charity. So they can go out and sell those entries and raise money and, uh, for their cause. So, you know, what does that mean for a local charity? Well, a lot of local charities put together, you've probably seen them, 5K walks or 10K runs, or, but they're a lot of work and they're very expensive. What we offer them instead is just come on and use our event and use it only for the price of a discounted entry. You don't have to organize anything. You don't have to pay for any tents. You don't have to buy insurance. You don't have to organize with police. Just come out and do what you do best, which is to raise money and awareness for your cause. So we love working with those folks, and we do it all year round. 
Um, so these are some of the supported charities that we work with. So one of the great things you'll see on race morning, beginning at 6.50 uh, a.m. on race morning, November 8th, you'll see a wheelchair field. This is something that we had to work very closely with our friends over at the MDTA to, to organize and allow to make it safe for disabled athletes to be a part of the event. So it's really wonderful. You see able-bodied athletes pushing individuals in wheelchairs that can't actually compete themselves. So it's just, just a wonderful project. And with that, I'd like to turn it over. Um, as many people know, but not everybody know, we actually work with one of the top, uh, top national teams for race organization. They, in addition to many other events, they actually manage the, uh, the Boston Marathon, uh, the BAA Boston Marathon in partnership with the Bo uh, Boston Athletic Association. So when we got the permission to do this event, we said we really needed top shelf help. So we went out to this team. That company is called DMSE. And there are two individuals from DMSE who've joined us tonight for this, uh, for this particular town hall. So before I hand it over to Sean, I just want to thank you again for coming and thank the commissioners again for all of your support. All right, thank you, Sparrow. So this is my second year uh, with the event. About a uh, little over two years ago, believe it or not, I got a call from Dave McGillivray, my boss. Dave is the BAA Boston Marathon director. And he said, hey, I just, and of course he said it in a Boston accent. I'm not from Boston, as you may have noticed. I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is, uh, we're in the NFC, so you guys don't have to hate on the Packers, right? Um, I'm, uh, I'm from Green Bay, Dave is from Boston, so he said in his Boston accent, hey, I got this uh, new contract for this race out in uh, Annapolis, and it's over a bridge. It's going to be really easy to produce this event. I mean, four and a half miles of a 10K race on a bridge, it's going to be easy. Well, he wasn't quite accurate. It was appealing. It was popular. It is showing huge growth potential. And the challenge, he was right, was not in the course. The course was not the biggest challenge of this race. Three quarters of the course was really easy. There was no avoiding it. Four and a half out of six miles on the bridge. But it was challenging securing the logistics for both the start and the finish, and even more challenging figuring out the transportation elements and the security elements that would go into getting the participants to the start and getting them back from the finish. And I'm happy to say we pulled it off last year. Uh, the event garnered a 98% approval rating from the participants, which is off the charts. And the most telling sign of a successful event is that it grows the next year. Because runners, just like restaurant goers or movie goers, are driven by and large by word of mouth and what they have to say uh, to one another and what they hear from one another about the event. So this event had very good buzz as evidenced by the fact that we're closing in quickly on 25,000, a 25% 25 increase. And that is not the case all over in the running world right now. Things are starting to plateau in the running world, and yet this event is really taking off. So I'm proud to be affiliated with it. I'm pleased to be working with Peter and Sparrow and their staff, with Queen Anne's County and Dr. Faith Elliott Rossing, and I'm also honored to be working with the MDTA police, and we've got Captain Ron's Alfred here and Lieutenant Eric Wilson and uh, I just want to thank them and single them out for all the hard work they've put into this and all the thoughtful comments they've put in. And um, you know because this goes over such a signature asset in the mid-Atlantic region uh, we are sensitive to keeping the participants safe. So there's a lot of effort and thought and manpower that goes into safely screening the participants before the race even starts on race day. So let me just take you through the logistics of how it's going to operate. This is the same format as last year. The race is going to start on the western shore right here at Northrop Grumman and we're very fortunate to have Northrop Grumman as a partner in this event and Mike Milhausen and his staff are wonderfully accommodating and allowing us to have 25,000 people traipse through their property on race morning. The participants start there on race morning. They uh, exit the property onto Old Ferry Slip Road, which is the service road uh, controlled by the MDTA, and they uh, loop around and do a U-turn right up onto the bridge, and then it's a four and a half mile shot across to the eastern shore before they ultimately finish at Chesapeake Bay Business Park. Uh, here's a few close-ups. This is Northrop Grumman property. The buses in the morning deliver the participants into the parking lot in waves all throughout the morning. Um, one of the things that will accommodate this event for long-term growth is we're not firing the gun once. 
Um, that is one of the challenges most events, frankly, face is they fire the gun once and it's however many people you can get to the start line or back from the finish, however many people you can park, what have you. That's what dictates the growth in most events, even the Boston Marathon. In this case, we have a two and a half hour start window. You know, we start the runners at 6.50 in the morning and that goes on until 9.20 with the negotiated agreement they have with the state. So it does allow in the long term for some more growth potential, but ultimately we're still gonna be limited by this right here. How many people can we deliver? So we're gonna let it slowly grow and see what we can, what we can let it grow up to. Uh, the participants after they arrive walk around the backside of the Northrop Grumman property. They wait for their wave to be called. They're assigned a start wave. There's porta potties, there's shelter tents, and ultimately uh, they enter into the start corral and when the horn is fired, they head out onto the bridge. They do a U-turn just before the toll plazas. Uh, there is a maintenance of traffic plan to keep the participants safe and completely separated from the moving motor vehicle traffic. Um, here's an aerial view of it, of what it looks like. The participants doing a U-turn right here up onto the bridge. When they get to the eastern shore and they land uh, down on the eastern shore at mile five, there are barricades and volunteers guiding them across the old footbridge that used to be used for the old Bay Bridge Walk onto the Bay Bridge Marina property. So right here, they use the old footbridge in reverse. So instead of walking out to the start area, they're finishing here on the Eastern Shore by coming across on the wooden footbridge. That takes them down onto the Bay Bridge Marina property and they go through the property, across that bridge, and they go down to, onto Pier 1 Road and there is cones separating the participants and the traffic there. So Hemingways and the marina remain open. The runners are at that point by mile five in a coned lane. And they make their way east on Pier 1 Road out to Route 8. And uh, here's what it looks like. That's the, the blue arrows indicate the flow of the runners. Uh, we've got some spectator parking there. Um, We've got cones, like I mentioned. This aerial was taken before the new road actually opened. Uh, it did open in time last year, so the runners were on the new road last year. It opened just a few weeks before last year's event. And then they turn onto Route 8, and they're in a coned lane uh, all the way from Pier 1 Road up to the finish in Chesapeake Bay Park. So they're on the westernmost side of the road, which means both north and southbound traffic still flow in Queen Anne's County. And that was important to the SHA. Jeff Wentz is the representative that we work with from the SHA. And he put a high priority on keeping both northbound and southbound traffic flowing at all times. Uh, that said, there are detours because with the runners crossing uh, the exit of US 50 eastbound, as well as the westbound 50 exit, it does force the need for a detour of residents to or from Stevensville under or from US 50. And then they travel up the westbound side of the road until they get to Skipjack Parkway, which is the first of the two entrances to Chesapeake Park. And they turn in right here with police assistance and they finish shortly after that turn. And you can see right here is the finish line. The large open green space um, at the entrance to the park, courtesy of KRM Development, is our finish area. And we're very fortunate to have KRM supporting this event. It's an 80-acre plot of land, and it allows plenty of space for the participants to recover, catch their breath, get a bottle of water, get a glass of beer or soda or what have you, get some food, listen to some nice music before they finally decide they're ready to leave. And when they are ready to leave, we've got shuttles to take them home or they'll have waiting family who will board a spectator shuttle with them, take them back to the spectator shuttle lots um, where they can then leave in their personal vehicle home. Now, something to point out, there's quite a bit of parking here in the Chesapeake Bay Business Park, but one of the first things we realized when we started the logistical planning for this event was we could not open up Kent Island and Chesapeake Bay Business Park for finish area parking for all of our participants. Because if we had 25,000 people trying to park in Chesapeake Bay Business Park, even if they carpooled two to three to a vehicle, it would overwhelm not only the infrastructure in the business park and on Kent Island, but it would in all likelihood in the early morning hours shut down the bridge and prevent us from getting this event off in a timely fashion. So one of the most logistically challenging aspects of this event is we can't have anybody park at the start line 
and we can't have anybody park at the finish line. And that's not only to ensure the ability of us to get our runners started in a timely fashion, it's also for the benefit of the residents on both shores. Because really, when you step back and you look at this plan from a 1,000 foot level, what we're doing is minimizing or eliminating any need for our own participants to drive over the bridge in their own personal vehicle in the morning. And in doing that, it allows the event to get off safely, it allows it to get off in a timely fashion, and it allows it to get off with minimal disruption uh, to the residents of Queen Anne's County as well as Anne Arundel County and anybody traveling across the bridge that day. And that, that was a significant challenge uh, the detour is forced by it. We do have, obviously, um, a detour for those heading eastbound on US 50 wanting to exit onto Kent Island, and they're going to come right down here onto Thompson Creek Road and simply double back on Thompson Creek Road. So that is a fairly simple detour. Somewhat more complicated detour, and you can see all the letters here, is what about people trying to get westbound on 50? Well, all of these letters ultimately are just indicators of what detour signs need to go up to safely get everybody over to Castle Marina Parkway. So everybody, uh, all the westbound traffic is directed ultimately over to Castle Marina. Um, it's a little farther than some of the other areas, but it's the safest, especially if we have buses and other large vehicles. So ultimately all of the westbound 50 detour traffic is sent over to Castle Marina. Transportation here is the uh, overview of the parking infrastructure that needs to happen to allow this to event, event to go off. And we're working with eight different parking lots. On the western shore, we've got uh, three lots. We're working with Anne Arundel Community College. That is a participant parking location. And new this year, we're also accommodating spectator parking there. And the reason I say we have spectator parking is we cannot have spectators at the start area. Northrop Grumman is limited in size. It is also a military contractor. We're sensitive to that, and we're sensitive to their willingness to accommodate us. Virtually everybody we're delivering there that day should be laced up in running shoes and ready to run. Unless they're working on the staff, or they're a volunteer, or they're an officer, it's really just for participants at the start area. So the spectator shuttles take them to the finish area. So that is both a participant and spectator location. We're also using the Harry Truman Park and Ride in Annapolis, as well as Navy Marine Corps Stadium. And that was one of the most popular parking areas last year. I imagine it will be so this year as well. And that is both participant and spectator parking. Truman Park and Ride is only participant parking. On the eastern shore, we've got uh, far to the east, Chesapeake College. For those coming from somewhat further out, uh, more convenient parking uh, if they live further out on the eastern shore. A little closer in, we've got uh, the Kent Narrow Center, and we've, we're using this year both the shopping center as well as the park and rides underneath the bridge. Those are county park and rides. We did overflow the Kent Narrow Center last year, so that is another participant parking location. Those are really our only two eastern shore participant parking locations. We also have spectator parking locations. Kent Island High School is a, per, is a spectator parking location. The Thompson Creek Park and Ride is a spectator parking location, and the Mattapique Schools are a spectator parking location. We do that for the convenience of the spectators. That way, if your friend or family member are running and you want to watch them finish, you can park in one of those three locations in relatively close proximity to the business park. It minimizes the ride, not just for you to arrive to the finish area, but if you're picking your friend or family member up after they finish, they can hop back on that return shuttle with you for a quick ride back to the Kent Island High School, Thompson Creek Park and Ride, or to Mattapique Schools. Fairly short ride for both of you, and then you can head home in your personal vehicle. So a lot of thought went into it. We have some fairly sophisticated parking calculations for each and every one. Uh, we were smart enough to survey our participants last year. Where did you park? Did you get dropped off? Did you carpool? So uh, Larry Murphy, who's here with me, and he is from Boston and does have a Boston accent, would be happy to share with you more details. But Larry is our guru of uh, transportation logistics at Boston, and he actually oversees the Boston Marathon Transportation Program, which by comparison to this is easy, right, Larry? <laughs> He's only got, we have the, in Boston, we have the Boston Common. We just tell everybody to go there and find a bus. It's much easier than this. But 
The, the transportation logistics are compl complex for this event, but we pulled it off last year. I'm confident with Larry's leadership we can do it again this year. And that's, that's how we do the transportation for the Across the Bay 10K. The schedule uh, for this year, just so you know what's going on while most people are sleeping, at midnight, the MDTA shuts, begins contraflow traffic on the westbound span. This is, of course, weather permitting. Only if the weather permits does this event go on. So torrential rain, this scares us. Torrential rain could halt this event, knock on wood. Um, but contraflow traffic is crucial because the only way this event goes on is the ability to have contraflow traffic on the northern span bridge. The eastbound span closes and setup begins. From one till five, we have screening uh, by the MDTA police of all of our vendors and personnel going up on the bridge, traffic control devices, fluid stations, porta potties, and medical support going up on the bridge from one till five. That gives us a safe two hour window um, before the race begins at about seven. From four to six, the detours begin over here in Queen Anne's County. At six o'clock, we have the first shuttle departures from the designated participant and spectator parking lots. So all of the delivery of the participants begins by six. So shortly before six, we have a go or no go call because once we start shuttling thousands here, um, we gotta do something with them, which is hopefully send them up onto the bridge. At 6.30, we expect participants to begin arriving to the start area. At 6.50, the first of 16 waves begins. Usually 1,700 runners each. Last year, we had gaps of 15 minutes between waves, which was more than enough. There was quite a bit of idle time uh, for both the runners as well as the staff at the start area. This year, to stay timely and get the bridge reopened as quickly as possible, uh, we're going to condense that to 10 minutes. So although we've gone up to 25,000 runners, we're not going to delay the reopening of the bridge whatsoever. Uh, this is really hard to see from where you're sitting, but what this shows is basically every 10 minutes from 6.50 until 9.20 in the morning, we've got 16 waves total, most of them of 1,700 uh, registrants each. There is a no-show rate, so what that really means is probably around 1,500 people in each of those waves. And the last wave is 1,200. That's at 9.20. So altogether, that's 25,000 bib numbers. Uh, 7.30 a.m., uh, if there's some fast runners in that first wave, and we expect there will be because we seed them from fastest to slowest, at about 7.30 or maybe even a few minutes beforehand, we expect the first participants to arrive at the finish line. 9.20, like I just explained, the, hopefully the last wave of runners starts, barring any delays or people hiding out in porta potties or buses running behind. 9.20, the last wave of runners or walkers starts. By noon, the last of the participants, according to the schedule, should be exiting US 50. And if you do the math on that, it's about five miles from the start to where they cross the footbridge in Bay Bridge Marina. Five miles, hopefully they can do that in two and a half hours. That's 30 minutes a mile. So there's really no reason to think that they shouldn't all be off of that bridge by noon. And if they are off the bridge by noon, that gives us a full two hours to clean up and remove equipment. Gordy doesn't like me saying it publicly, but last year we were reopened at 12.15. Uh, so the contract calls for 2 o'clock. Internally, uh, or what, we, what we like to tell a lot of the agencies is we're striving for 1 o'clock, and what we'd really like to do is please everybody, surprise everybody, and the minute that last walker exits the bridge, we're picking up a road cone behind him or her, and that bridge is reopening shortly after 12 o'clock. But uh, technically, we have until 2 um, you know, barring any delays, our crews should be right behind those last participants. So that is the goal uh, last year, and that is the goal this year. 2 p.m. at the latest, the eastbound span would reopen to motor vehicle traffic. But again, we beat that uh, by quite a bit last year. Environmental concerns, people do ask about, uh, are we environmentally sensitive? Yes, we are. Uh, we do recycle, so this is a green event. Um, and this, I'm proud to announce, was the largest cup-free race in history last year. Uh, when we started working with the MDTA, I expected when I met Gordy Gerritsen that uh, he'd be all concerned about what types of barricades, road cones, uh, how much personnel, how many volunteers. And the first thing he said to me is, you can't have a single cup up on that bridge. And I said, well, it's a road race. We've got to have cups. They need water. It's six miles. How are we not going to have a cup? He said, I don't know. That's your job. Figure it out, kid. And we did. 
and we figured it out, and we had the largest cup-free race in history, and we set a lot of new standards in the industry, and a lot of other races are contacting us and asking us, how did we pull this off? Well, what we did is we worked with these giant tanks called water monsters. We had eight 125-gallon tanks at each of two water stations, one at the midpoint of the bridge and one on the eastern shore. That's 1,000 gallons, eight tanks of 125 gallons each, 1,000 gallons, and we had these PVC manifolds with high-speed valves, and the participants were told in advance that they had to bring their own container. It couldn't be a glass from home, no glass, but they could bring a bike bottle, they could bring a flask, they could bring... Um, some of them wear these little things called fuel belts or hydro pouches. They had to bring their own device to carry the fluids in, but they could bring that, and you can see this gentleman here refilling it, and they could just step aside into the fluid zone out of the runner flow. They could step in there and refill, and it can spit out about six ounces a second. So it was a quick and easy way to do it. It eliminated the need for cups, and one of the things we discovered, we worried about what about the people that forgot their cups? Well, it's amazing, I should have known this from science class, but when you put 1,000 gallons of downward pressure on a 200-foot run of inch-and-a-half PVC and one of the valves is upside down and someone hits the flapper, it functions just like a water fountain. So there's my boss, Dave, from Boston right there, and what we did is I think every third or fourth valve we leave inverted, so if they don't have a cup, they can just step aside and it works just like a water fountain. So even if they don't bring their own cup to carry and they just want a quick swig of water, they can step aside and get it just like that. So it's pretty exciting to say that uh, we, we set another record by being the largest cup-free race in history. I will now turn it back to Sparrow Rogers for final comments and uh, we will then open for Q&A. Go to the microphone. Um, so before we before we open it for questions, I just want to thank. I know uh, Scott Haas is here as well. We talk a lot about security, but there's a, a huge element of safety and uh, and keeping everybody healthy out there. Last year, I think we had 13 different agencies representing uh, various police agencies, um, emergency service agencies from multiple counties. So I think it's tremendous. Not only are we putting together a running event, but we're putting together an event that really has support and buy-in for a Queen Anne's County event that comes from all over the state of Maryland. So uh, I love the fact that we have that kind of partnership around the state, and we are truly appreciative that they work on it all year long with us. So that's, you know, we can't take all the credit at all. As a matter of fact, we're just there most of the time trying to get them in the room so they can help us figure things out. So um, thank you all for being here. We're going to open it up for questions. And I think uh, Dr. Elliot Rossing had a question. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, one of the questions was, what kind of notification? So here we're having a town hall meeting so that individuals from the community have the opportunity to come and ask us questions or clarify or express concerns. But we do many other forms of communication directly through the race, but also through many of our partners. And so, you know, we do uh, television broadcasts. We do radio broadcasts. The Maryland Department of Transportation um, actually sends out their own notifications. We do, uh, we work with um, news agencies all across the state to let people know. So one of the things, I was with the Secretary of Transportation last year on race morning, and one of the things that he remarked upon was, if you would have told us that traffic would have been this smooth, we would have laughed you out of the room. We thought with this many participants, we were gonna have, like imagine the worst Saturday in July or the worst Friday afternoon in July. People anticipated very heavy traffic impact. It was smooth sailing. There were, there were minimal delays in a couple of different places, but it was very, for those of us who live on the Eastern Shore, we're used to much, much worse. So we do that because, so we do robocalling, we do partner communications, we do public outreach, um, so that we can try to inform everybody. If you're not in the event, watch out, expect heavy, um, expect heavy delays. And then I want to thank also our partners over at the MDTA. One of the officers, and, and Officer Wilson, I just want to thank you for this. One of their officers goes to each religious organization here on the Eastern Shore, each church, to say, guess what, this is going on on a Sunday. We want to make sure that you're aware of it so that you're not negative, negatively impacted, which is just a wonderful outreach happening from, again, our public safety partners. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, we, so again, so we do press releases. There are news wires that go out. We get calls from, there are, I don't know if you guys know this, but there are channels that do nothing but news around the state of Maryland. I think it's very interesting. They call us six months ahead of time and they ask for these road closure programs. Very interesting. Uh, we also have a, a director of communications. Liz, would you stand up really quickly? This is, 
So this is our newest team addition. This is Liz DeRosa, Dr. DeRosa, who's handling communications for us. So she's on all of those channels that the public now uses, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other things that I know nothing about. She's making sure that everybody's very aware of what's going on. Um, so guess what else? We have 25,000 people involved in the event. This is a great channel for us to communicate to the public. A lot of these folks live around here. So we're very clear with them about what's going on to make sure that they have a smooth transportation morning and that any of their friends and family who come out to watch it have a smooth transportation morning. <laughs> Sean, Sean would like you to volunteer, evidently. Um, yeah, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to uh, Dr. Faith Elliott Rossing. I know that... I know that a few other people walked in uh, since the beginning of the meeting. And first of all, I just want to thank you for coming. There was a sign-in sheet out on the desk. I'm not sure if you saw it. If you didn't, if you would sign in before you leave, we'll make sure that a copy of this presentation is emailed to you, uh, to your personal email address, so that you can look through it again. You can share it if you need to. Uh, the other question on the sign-in sheet is, how did you hear about this meeting? And in one of my ever... Uh, present things that I try and keep in front of me is how do I best reach out to people and so it's important to me of all the avenues that I reach out or try to reach out to the public and Sparrow mentioned most of them uh, it's important that we understand how to reach you and so if you just share that with us then it gives us a little guidance as to how best to target people to make sure that they are at least aware in a meeting like this it's actually kind of comforting to know that hopefully if people didn't come it's because they're comfortable because we've been through it once we did have more people that were here last year and you know but the information's out there and we're the county will still be doing a push as well from here until the event day so if you have any other questions you can certainly give my office a call thank you